Well, I'm going to talk about Theodore Roosevelt and the Constitution. And I want to say basically three things. The first is, with the Constitution, TR had a distinctive vision which became reality, mostly after his death, in part through the efforts of his cousin FDR. But we did get what you could call the Roosevelt Constitution. And I think it's something to be proud of. The Roosevelt Constitution is an improvement over the one that preceded it. But here's the second thing. It's also incomplete, and dangerously so. Its incompleteness was laid bare during FDR's presidency. In an important way, the Roosevelt Constitution failed then. Then the third thing, what happens when our Constitution fails? Well, we react, we try to improve things. And the improvement that comes from the failure of the Roosevelt Constitution is the most recent step in our constitutional development. It's what gives us our modern constitutional era. So that's the story I'm going to tell, these three parts. And it's also going to connect to some larger ideas about who we are, who we want to be, who are the heroes and the villains of the American story. Uh, it won't help you pass the bar, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I hope it will be interesting. So on to the first point. What was Theodore Roosevelt's vision of the Constitution? A lot of people seem to think at the time, some people still think now, that Theodore Roosevelt didn't have much regard for the Constitution. Um, as Lee said, Speaker of the House Joe Cannon, in this widely noted bon mot, said he had as much use for it as a Tomcat has for a marriage license. But that's not really true. Um, Theodore Roosevelt had a vision of the Constitution that was a bit out of step with his times. It was ahead of his times. But it was truly a constitutional vision, and ultimately it did prevail. What was it? Well, I'm going to try to give you this in part through the words of Theodore Roosevelt himself. Some of his most famous speeches come from the 1912 election. And in his candidacy then, he said a lot about the Constitution. In many ways, his vision of the Constitution actually formed the basis of his candidacy. So what was this progressive party, this bull moose vision of the Constitution? There are basically two things that Theodore Roosevelt and the progressives stood for. First, they wanted a broad understanding of federal legislative power. They wanted Congress to be able to regulate more than the Supreme Court said it was allowed to. And they wanted broad federal power for basically two reasons. One was to allow the federal government to check the influence of large multi-state corporations. The other was to create federal protections for workers, things like minimum wage and maximum hour laws, bans on child labor, workplace safety regulations, on a nationwide basis, rather than leaving them up to the states, where they might not be enacted or they might be thwarted by state judges. They also stood for a narrow understanding of the Due Process Clause. So in 1912, when TR was giving these speeches, the Supreme Court was in the middle of what legal historians call the Lochner Era. They call it that because of a case named Lochner against New York, where the Supreme Court struck down a New York law that set a 50-hour maximum work week for bake shop employees. And the Supreme Court struck this down because the justices believed the law did not promote the public interest. They thought it was what we would now call special interest legislation, legislation that favored one group, the bake shop employees, at the expense of another group, the bake shop owners. That kind of legislation, the Supreme Court said, was unconstitutional under the Due Process Clause. TR and the progressives disagreed, so they wanted to interpret the Due Process Clause more narrowly, so that it gave the states and the federal government more room to regulate. That would allow the sorts of workplace and economic regulation that the progressives believed were desirable. But here comes the more interesting part of the Roosevelt position. So with respect to broad federal power, TR said basically, I think this is how the Constitution should be interpreted. If federal power doesn't, in fact, reach far enough to do the sorts of things that I want to do, we should amend the Constitution to give the federal government that power, which is pretty standard stuff. What he says about the Due Process Clause is actually a bit more interesting. This is where democracy comes into it. So what the courts were saying, remember, was that things like minimum wage laws were unconstitutional because they didn't promote the public interest. They promoted instead some special interest. They were partial legislation. And what TR said there was not just that he interpreted public interest differently from the courts, although he did. He said that the people ought to be the ultimate authority about what was in the public interest. When a judge is interpreting the due process clause, TR said, he must represent the people. Now that's interesting, because we don't generally think that way about the relationship between judges, the people, and the Constitution. We generally think that the people made the Constitution, right? We the people, people with a capital P. But we the people is not really us. 
It's not us here in this room. We in this room didn't ratify the Constitution. We the people are in the past. Maybe 1788 with ratification, maybe 1791 with the Bill of Rights, maybe 1868 with the Reconstruction Amendments, maybe even 1992, which was the last time the Constitution was amended. But that's in the past. And in the here and now, most people think, judges tell us what the Constitution means. We can't change it. The people don't get to decide that. So here TR is coming out with a startlingly democratic view of constitutional interpretation. And indeed, democracy was the main value that he and the progressives were trying to champion. In terms of the policies that he favored, he wanted policies that would distribute benefits more broadly, that would benefit everyone instead of just the powerful. It was one of the great battles of the age, he said, the long contest waged against privilege on behalf of the common welfare. And the way to make that happen, he believed, was to enhance democracy, to create a government that was responsive to everyone, that took everyone's interests into account, instead of listening just to the powerful and the wealthy. He wanted to do this in several ways. He supported women's right to vote. Expanding the franchise promotes democracy. He wanted a constitutional amendment that would make constitutional amendments easier. If the Constitution is blocking the popular will, lowering the amendment hurdle will make it easier for the majority to have its way. He wanted US senators to be elected by a direct vote of the people, rather than being selected by state legislatures. And that idea there is it reduces corruption. A rich person can bribe enough state legislators to affect the vote, but it's harder to bribe the people of an entire state. So TR here is fighting for democracy as a means to promote the common good rather than special interests. The American people, we the people, are the good guys in this story. Who is he fighting against? Who are the bad guys, the enemies of democracy? Well, there are two answers here. The progressive platform identifies what it calls an invisible government, a power that sits enthroned behind the ostensible government, owing no allegiance and acknowledging no responsibility to the people. That's what the progressives were going after. To destroy this invisible government, they said, is the first task of the statesmanship of the day. And what was the invisible government? It was an unholy alliance between corrupt business and corrupt politics. So here are some villains, big business. Now, not all big business, but big business that seeks to leverage its economic power into the political realm in order to get still richer. The malefactors of great wealth, as TR said. And of course, the corrupt politicians who do their bidding. One thing that TR wanted was to make it easier to get rid of corrupt politicians. But that can usually be done. The people can get their way with respect to a legislature. There's another set of villains, though, who often can't be overcome at the ballot box and whose decisions can't be undone by ordinary lawmaking. And that's judges. So don't worry. I'm going to go back and forth on who's the heroes and who's the villains. Right now, I'm saying, just for the moment, some judges, maybe. Don't worry. I'm going to have a more complicated view. But particularly with the due process clause, as I said before, but in other areas as well, so the limits on federal legislative power, TR saw judges as at least sometimes the villains. And he had various ideas for how to restrain them, things like recalls and popular overrides, most of which he was interested in at the state rather than the federal level. But what's interesting to me as a constitutional law professor and former judicial clerk, so I like judges. I've worked for judges, love the judges I worked for. But it's interesting to me this idea of judges as villains. Um, because, as I'll say later, in the constitutional story that we tell ourselves a lot of the time, the judges are the heroes. Hmm, why is that? Well, think about the judges as villains for a second. What is it that these bad judges do? The answer is they interfere with democracy. They take away the right of the people to rule. TR gave a speech with that title, The Right of the People to Rule, at Carnegie Hall in New York in 1912. But you get maybe an even clearer and more famous statement of the idea from his 1912 speech to the Chicago Convention, where he says, I deny that the American people have surrendered to any set of men no matter what their position or their character, the final right to determine those fundamental questions upon which free self-government ultimately depends. The people themselves must be the ultimate makers of their own constitution. The people themselves. That quote is actually on the wall of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, which I encourage you to visit if you haven't already. So the bad judges, they prevent the people from ruling themselves, from engaging in democracy to the extent that they should be able to. Bad judges take over the policy-making function that belongs to a legislature. 
they start, in effect, making laws rather than just interpreting them. They base decisions maybe on their own political preferences rather than law. And this is what people mean nowadays when they talk about judicial activism. So that's the term that I'm going to use from now on, judicial activism. This is actually a big interest of mine. Um, I have another book called The Myth of Judicial Activism, which is entirely devoted to this question. Um, anyway, activism sounds terrible, doesn't it? And it is. But there are two things to think about. First question is, what did the judges think they were doing? So it's an important fact about the world that most people think they're doing the right thing. The villains who embrace evil for its own sake exist in simplistic fiction. You won't find them in my novel. So the judges thought that they were the good guys. And they thought that because of a particular theory, which I mentioned already, but I'm going to discuss it again because it's going to come back later. Their theory is the government has to make laws to promote the public interest, to make society as a whole better off. You can't make a law that benefits one group at the expense of another, or that is designed simply to oppress some group. Now, actually, most people agreed on that. In fact, most constitutional scholars and judges still do. What was different about the judges at the turn of the 20th century was that they thought that things like the maximum hour or minimum wage laws did not promote the public interest that they were, as I said, what we would now call special interest legislation. They promoted the interests of one group, the employees, at the expense of another, the employers. These were laws, according to the courts, that unfairly discriminated against the employers, that oppressed them. So in their own eyes, the courts were the heroes, defending the Constitution, preventing oppressive discrimination. In the eyes of TR and the progressives, they were the villains, preventing desirable reform, protecting the interests of the wealthy and the powerful. How do you decide who's right? TR's view was that we should let the people decide what's reasonable and what's oppressive. When judges are called on to make that decision, he said, they should represent the people. And I'm going in the end to say that he's right, but not right in quite the way he thought. Before I explain how he's right, though, I want to tell you how he's wrong, how his vision of the Constitution proved inadequate. And the way to that point goes through another question about judicial activism, which is, is this terrible thing rare in our constitutional history? Was TR the first president to confront it? And did we then get past it? Did he vanquish the activist judges? The answers to those questions, I see you're shaking your head. Yes, the answer to those questions are no, no, and no. So as to the first, complaints about activism have been with us almost since the beginning of American constitutional history. You could quite plausibly say that Marbury v. Madison the first great constitutional decision of the Supreme Court, which established the power of judicial review, is an example of judicial activism. You could definitely say it about Dred Scott, which held that the descendants of slaves could never be US citizens. Abraham Lincoln did say that. TR referenced Dred Scott and Lincoln in his criticism of activist judges. And Lincoln actually prefigured much of what TR would say. So here's Lincoln. If the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. Sounds very much like what TR would say in 1912. So what have I said so far? TR had a distinctive constitutional vision. He favored a strong national government with broad power to regulate. He believed that government should promote the common good rather than serve the interests of the powerful. And in order to make it perform that function better, he wanted to enhance democratic control over government. He saw the enemies of this program as corrupt corporations, corrupt politicians, and activist judges. And in his complaints about activist judges, he echoed and indeed frequently quoted Abraham Lincoln. So what happened? If you read the progressive platform from 1912, one of the things that will really strike you is how much of that platform is now law, how much of it is in fact constitutional law. The progressives wanted to confirm the power of the federal government to tax income, which the Supreme Court had thrown into doubt in 1895. That's the 16th Amendment, ratified in 1913. They wanted direct election of senators. That's the 17th Amendment, also ratified in 1913. They wanted to give women the right to vote. That's the 19th Amendment, ratified in 1920. If you look at American history, constitutional change tends not to happen slowly. It happens in bursts with quiet periods in between. 
So we get the first 10 amendments all on a package in 1791. That's the Bill of Rights. We get another explosion of activity after the Civil War. That's the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. And what follows TR's failed 1912 presidential bid is another burst of higher lawmaking, the 16th, 17th, and 19th Amendments. That's the progressive constitutional moment. Now I'm skipping over the 18th. That was prohibition, not such a great idea. We ended up repealing that. But 16th, 17th, 19th Amendments, that's the progressive vision of the Constitution. TR's constitutional vision wins. But that's not the whole vision, right? Because I've also been talking about broader federal legislative power. Well, what happens there? TR does not entirely prevail, not in his time. The battle about the extent of federal legislative power continues, and it continues most notably in the New Deal era, where the Supreme Court pushes back quite hard against Franklin Roosevelt's attempt to expand the power of the federal government. Now, FDR, I think, in many ways, is carrying out TR's policies. I think the New Deal is, in large part, the fulfillment of the Square Deal. And FDR meets the same problem. It's those activist judges. He describes it in much the same way as TR did. The court has been acting not as a judicial body, but as a policymaking body, he says. It has improperly set itself up as a third house of the Congress, a super legislature. And he proposes his court packing plan, of course, as a way to rescue the Constitution from the court. Now, court packing fails, so FDR loses that battle. But he wins the war. The court backs down. We get an acceptance of broader federal legislative power. Same thing happens with TR's vision of the Due Process Clause. In 1935, the Supreme Court gives up on the idea that it can define what the public interest is and strike down laws that depart from it. The Supreme Court didn't yield this function to the people, which is what TR wanted, but they yielded it to the legislature, which is similar. When the legislature has spoken, the court said some years later, the public interest has been declared in terms well nigh conclusive. And what about the last part of this struggle, the struggle against activist judges? Well, this didn't start with TR, I said. You can trace it back to Lincoln or even further. And it didn't end with him either. FDR fought the same battle. But FDR, I've just said, won. The court gave in. So is that the moment? when activist judges were vanquished? The answer is actually yes, for a while. FDR keeps getting reelected. He ends up with a Supreme Court where eight of the nine justices are his appointees. And this is a Supreme Court that is very deferential to the federal government. FDR has picked people who trust the federal government, who have a broad view of federal power. And this is what I would call the Roosevelt Constitution. It's inclusive, it's democratic, but the federal government has a lot of power and the court basically trusts it to do the right thing. So how does that work out? Well, it works out okay in terms of domestic economic regulation, which is an important thing. The Great Depression was a serious crisis. There should have been a national response. The Supreme Court was thwarting that. But the Great Depression is not the only crisis that FDR gets. Because on December 7, 1941, the Empire of Japan attacks the United States fleet at Pearl Harbor. The destruction is enormous. All eight battleships are damaged, two totally lost. Over 300 aircraft damaged or destroyed, 2,400 service members killed. More than the material devastation, though, the attack inflicts a psychological injury. Americans aren't used to being attacked at home. Wars are things fought across the sea, not on American soil. So the immediate reaction is panic. Are more attacks coming? Is this part of a coordinated series of strikes? In fact, it was, though only one took place in America. Most fundamentally, people wonder what's next. In Washington, D.C., troops are called out to protect government buildings. People empty supermarkets and hoard food. And government lawyers start writing memos about what can be done to keep the country safe. One idea that they come up with relatively quickly is removing the Japanese and Japanese Americans from the West Coast. And the government does that. Over 100,000 people, mostly birthright American citizens, are forced to leave their homes. They end up detained in camps in the interior of the country. There are lawsuits challenging this program in federal court. The Supreme Court ends up deciding three cases about the rights of the Japanese Americans. In one of them, a case called Hirabayashi, the court says unanimously, 9-0, it's permissible to impose a curfew on the Japanese and Japanese Americans on the West Coast. In another case, a case called Endo, they say again unanimously, it is not permissible for the government to detain citizens in camps without some individualized reason to doubt their loyalty, something more than race. 
But the case I'm going to focus on is a case called Korematsu. And there the court said, in a 6-3 decision, with some pretty fierce dissents, that it was okay to make the ethnic Japanese leave their homes. Now, why was that? Why did all that happen? Lots of reasons. I explore them in greater detail in the novel. But to connect it to what I was calling the Roosevelt Constitution, the provision that Fred Korematsu invoked in his lawsuit, the one he said protected him from this government action, was the Due Process Clause, the same one that the activist judges, TR and FDR, opposed were using to frustrate economic regulation. You can't set a maximum hour law, the judges said, because it is not a reasonable way to promote the public interest. It's oppressing one group to benefit another. But the court that decided Korematsu was not willing to make that call. Reasonableness, oppression, the public interest, we're going to let the people, through their elected representatives, through the military experts, we're going to let them decide what the public interest is, what's reasonable, what's oppressive. So now perhaps we see the problem with Theodore Roosevelt's vision of the Constitution, where the people get the last word. Korematsu is a chapter in the story where suddenly the people look like the villains, the bad guys. Now, not all of them. Some people, both inside and outside the government, did say this is wrong, this is un-American, unconstitutional. But that was a minority. The majority thought it was OK. TR was worried about what he called the tyranny of the minority, about judges taking the side of the malefactors of great wealth. But there's also, of course, the problem of tyranny of the majority. The problem is the majority may discount the interests of unpopular groups, people who are different, particularly in wartime, particularly when people are scared. And that's what you see with the Japanese Americans. The majority thinks, the government says, it's reasonable to make all these people leave their homes because some of them might be disloyal and we want to keep the country safe. Turns out, in retrospect, that was not reasonable. If you're balancing the harm to the Japanese American population against the safety gain to the rest of the country, it's entirely unreasonable. It's wildly out of proportion. There is, in fact, no safety gain. It probably makes us less safe. But the majority thinks it is, and their will prevails. And that was wrong. It was wrong in basically the same way as the things that TR identified as problems in the progressive era, which is to say the government was not weighing everyone's interests equally. In TR's time, he was concerned that the government and judges were overcounting the interests of a powerful minority. Here, they're undercounting the interests of a weak minority. But it's basically the same problem. And it's a problem that judges can do something about. After Korematsu, they did. We get greater judicial assertiveness about the rights of racial minorities in cases like Brown v. Board of Education, Loving against Virginia. Then in cases about the rights of women. Then in cases about the rights of gays and lesbians. And all of these cases, you could say, come from Korematsu, from the lesson that the court learned there about the dangers of letting the majority decide what's a reasonable way to treat a minority. Korematsu is, in fact, actually the first case to say Racial classifications that take away the rights of a minority are especially suspect. But all this leaves us with a bit of a puzzle. And it's one that neither the Supreme Court nor the modern legal academy has fully solved. So in the time that remains, I want to tell you what that puzzle is and then try to suggest a solution. So we now have a more assertive court than the one that the Roosevelt vision of the Constitution gave us. And some of the assertive decisions that the court has made are considered great ones. Cases like Brown v. Board of Education, Loving against Virginia. Some of them are controversial. Roe v. Wade. You might say Obergefell against Hodges, although I think that one's going to be accepted pretty soon. And also, there are some decisions that are widely considered bad. Citizens United is an example. Not everyone thinks that bad, that's bad, of course. But if you poll the public, a lot of them will say, we don't like what the Supreme Court is doing in the area of, say, campaign finance reform. Um, and those decisions look a fair amount like the kinds of decisions that TR and FDR opposed. So the question that we have is, when is the court justified in coming in to set aside the result of the ordinary democratic process? If you look at the cases that I've mentioned, it seems like sometimes the court should. Brown, Korematsu. Sometimes it shouldn't. Lochner, maybe. Or the cases striking down the New Deal. Or maybe Citizens United. So what's the difference between those cases? I would suggest the difference is that in the cases where the court was right to come in, you can tell a pretty plausible story about why the democratic process won't work, why you can't trust the majority when they say that something is a reasonable way to promote the public interest. 
And the main reason there is going to be that the costs of what they're doing, driving Japanese Americans from their homes, segregating schools, the costs fall on a group with whom the majority doesn't empathize, people whose interests they aren't likely to weigh accurately. Racial minorities are the clearest example of this, but you could also point to women or gays and lesbians. But you can't say the same thing about corporations. You can't really say the same thing about rich people who want to contribute lots of money to political candidates. Those are not people who lack political power. Those are not outsiders, people who are viewed with suspicion because they're different, people who are misunderstood. Those are people for whom the ordinary democratic process works just fine. So my suggestion here is that the proper role of courts in a democracy is to protect the people whose interests aren't adequately counted, not to give more power to the people who have much already. And that's something that I think TR and FDR would both have agreed with. Now suppose judges do what I'm saying they should do. Who are the heroes in this story? You might think it's the judges. Activist judges turn out to be not so bad if they're activists in the right cases. And there is something that we can say about when they should be activists. We can say they should be activists in defense of the politically weak, not in the service of the politically powerful. But here's the slightly harder question. Can judges actually protect the weak and the unpopular? The answer to that really is it depends. If you look at the equality movements of American history, which basically so far are race, sex, and sexual orientation. They follow a very precise pattern. There's a period of time when most people think that discrimination is justified, that it makes perfect sense to say blacks and whites can't ride in the same railroad cars. It makes perfect sense to say women can't practice laws. It makes perfect sense to say that people can go to jail for same-sex sexual activity. During this period of time, courts don't interfere. You have the tyranny of the majority. And then how do things change? Not through the courts, not initially. And this too is something that TR saw. If the majority of the American people, he said, were in fact tyrannous of the minority, if democracy had no greater self-control than empire, then indeed no written words which our forefathers put into the Constitution could stay that tyranny. So it's not the courts, and it's not the Constitution. What happens historically in each of these cases is a social movement arises to challenge that discrimination to say, no, this isn't reasonable, this isn't justified, this is oppressive. If that social movement succeeds, which is to say, if the American people change their minds, then the court steps in and says this discrimination is unconstitutional, which means no one can do it anymore, not even in states where a majority still thinks it's okay. And what the court is doing there is enforcing the will of a national majority against local majorities, outlier states that are not in step with the national consensus. And this is actually the pattern of all of our major equality decisions for civil rights, racial equality, for women's rights, for gays and lesbians too. The court is actually following the evolution of popular opinion. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the values the Supreme Court enforces are ultimately the values of the American people. It means the judges cannot be better than the people. You cannot rely on judges. Liberty lives in the hearts of the people, said Judge Learned Hand. If it dies there, no court can save it. So too for fairness, so too for justice, so most of all for empathy. Empathy is what allows us to make the distinction between reasonable laws and oppressive ones. Empathy is what lets us understand the costs that we inflict on people who are different from us, people who might seem scary or dangerous. All of which is to say that the true heroes of these equality movements are actually the social entrepreneurs who spoke out and we the people who heard them. We are the heroes or the villains of the American story. And that's actually what the novel is about. It's an attempt to tell a chapter of that story to show you the heroes and villains of the past in the hopes that we can learn something for the future. Thank you.